thank you for this uh, morning to start with a very timely and important topic, the future of work. I think the future of work is happening already now. At the same time, when I read some uh, studies, 85% of the jobs in 2030 are still not existing. So it's really a process, I think, very difficult for the, uh, the legal decision makers because how you can regulate something what is already happening and at the same time, it's not, not it's still in a process in, in the very beginning. And if, uh, we are, I'm very happy that we have today Sarah Skittedal, member of the European Parliament here in the discussion from Sweden, member of ITRE, Liebe and Empel. Thank you that you have time to discuss this, this, this uh, topic. I think it's really related with chances and challenges. And it's, it's, uh, we have to see where we find the way where we can use all the good opportunities and how to make it in a good way for the citizens and consumers. Then we have Glenn Hodgson, very well known in the community of the future of work and, and uh, platform economy. He is secretary general of the freelance movement. Then we have today for the first time David Motenda. I, say, I hope I say the name right. Head of public policy board. And we need to have to say a European company, very well known, but we have not so many European companies who have such a success. Thank you that you have time for us. And then Adam Populski, legal analyst, Department of Law and Legislation of the Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers of Poland, a very strong partner of SM Connect. And my name is Horst Heitz. SM Connect is a network. We are representing around 3 million SMEs in our, with our organizations. And I want to start directly in the discussion with some questions were raised by the commission. They, they come up to say the future of work is an opportunity, but has also social risks. And they wanted to discuss uh, in the upcoming legislation, the quality of jobs and employment, social protection, the, and the next generation of manufacturing, the intersection of health and employment, as well as the platform economy, inclusive workplaces, reskilling and upskilling human machine collaborations. So there's a lot of, the, uh, of to, to discuss. And I think we start with Sarah and, and to say, what is going on now in, 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 the, in the parliament? Where is your point of view on these things? Where is the special point of Sweden? I think your, your, your country is always a little bit ahead to, to the others, especially to Germany where I'm from. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, I would really like to thank SME Connect for organizing this very timely event, especially ahead of the consideration of the, uh, the draft report being uh, discussed uh, in EMPO committee on Thursday when it comes to the platform work directive, which is one of the, of course, uh, biggest things that's going, going to uh, possibly uh, regulate uh, this, this area uh, a lot and I would like to, to focus uh, on that uh, proposal in my uh, in my speech here and from my position as an MEP and vice coordinator of, of the EPP in EMPL I'm happy to, to briefly share my thoughts on, on both the Commission's proposal and the rapporteur's draft report as well as uh, the ambitions that I have to uh, to put forward amendments that uh, we will table uh, before June uh, 1st. So I will uh, start by shortly explaining uh, uh, why uh, my view of this directive is a bit more critical than the views maybe uh, held by a majority of colleagues, both in EMPL, but also uh, in Parliament uh, as a whole. Uh, in summary, I have two main concerns. Uh, firstly, uh, this directive risks uh, becoming yet another instance of EU putting forward a uh, one-size-fits-all solution uh, to address challenges that differ fundamentally between different member states. And I think this is something that we, during this current mandate, has already seen, uh, uh, both with, uh, for instance, the minimum wage directive and pay transparency. And I believe for uh, platform workers, I believe the challenges with the new EU directive are even more substantial. Uh, I believe that the growing platform economy offers a lot of potential and benefits. And uh, of course, it also poses some issues, but neither uh, the benefits or the challenges are uh, similar when you compare different labor market models in, in different member states. And for instance, Sweden and Portugal is going to be 
quite different. And this is why I believe that the regulation uh, of platform work uh, and the definition who should be an employee in the first place would be, be better suited for the national uh, uh, competence. So secondly, uh, I am very concerned that uh, especially the position that is uh, the European Parliament eventually will adopt will pose severe threats to European competitiveness. Uh, well, uh, I am of course aware that several platform companies have asked for increased legal certainty uh, through a directive. I do see a clear risk uh, that this will not be achieved since member states insist on national concepts and definitions uh, of, of who is an employee. So what will likely be achieved, however, is uh, uh, a one-size-fits-all solution, which regards to uh, the different forms of platform work. And I fear that such a, such a regulation that is aimed, uh, I think, mostly uh, for, for instance, couriers, but also regulating, uh, for instance, experts in uh, coding or translation, uh, that will drive certain jobs that can be done anywhere in the world to be held more or less outside the European Union uh, exclusively. So uh, those are the reasons why I did not support the Commission putting forward this directive at all. And now when we already have the proposal on the table, of course, we must uh, be constructive and strive to uh, minimize uh, the, uh, the faults and make it as good as possible. And while uh, it is true that I found, uh, I find that council most often is better at finding reasonable compromises uh, than uh, at least from uh, myself, mine and my constituents perspective, I must say that the draft reports that we will discuss on Thursday surprised me uh, in how damaging it potentially is. And to become more concrete and maybe a bit more technical, but uh, I, I think that's needed when, when we talk about concrete proposals. I think the obvious problems are, uh, the, the most obvious ones are that I think that the rapporteur by taking out the uh, five criteria that we see in article four, instead inserting a much longer list of criteria in the recitals really lowers the bar of who is to be presumed to be an employee. And also by proposed changes in, for instance, Article 5 raises the bar for platforms that are uh, uh, to prove that the presumption is inaccurate. So there would obviously be a lot of negative consequences from these changes. Uh, the most negative one being the possible wrongful classification of millions of self-employed and independent contractors as employees instead. And the long and costly process for platforms to rebuke uh, these presumptions. Uh, so one of my main uh, priorities in Ample, I will therefore be put, for, put forward amendments that uh, go uh, in the complete other direction uh, and uh, to minimize the risk of self-employed and independent contractors being wrongfully classified as employees. And the, as we, of course, uh, have not yet finalized the amendments, I cannot go into details on how these will be uh, put forward, uh, but uh, I think it's safe to say that the general approach means amending the Commission's uh, proposals to extend that the majority of these, uh, this list of criteria must be fulfilled to trigger, to trigger the presumption, presumption of being uh, employed. Uh, I will also try to modify the text to a greater extent to make it more predictable and more in line with the so-called uh, yodel criteria. Uh, the commission proposal uh, would, uh, among other things, severely limit what uh, standards the platforms can require in forms of uh, price and quality control. And I think it's fair to argue that some control over these issues are uh, inherent to the business models uh, that both consumers and independent uh, contractors enjoy. Uh, I, I think it will also be uh, to make sure that uh, platforms are the most ambitious, uh, ambitious and responsible uh, for the safety and well being of contractors, uh, should not be punished for this. We should uh, encourage <laughs> this instead. So I'm here, of course, thinking about the Raptor's proposal that. Uh, for instance, uh, providing uh, insurance uh, would be a strong indication of uh, employment relationship. I think this is very flawed uh, thinking. 
So uh, to summarize, uh, as a Swedish MEP representing constituents that are very much concerned with European com competitiveness, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to see that we have now on the table yet another directive that regulates additional aspects of employment affairs on the EU level. And I think, uh, yet again, uh, this is something that is better suited uh, to be left by the member states. And, uh, but we are where we are at this point, and I'm really looking forward to put forward constructive amendments uh, that can lead to uh, a European Parliament position that is at least better uh, than the draft to be presented by the rapporteur. And, in com and I, I think by uh, seeing a combination with uh, uh, promising, of course, developments in council, I do have some hope that this will uh, improve, of course. Um, and lastly, I think that one key point in this process will be to really speak out about the benefits of the flexibility and effectiveness uh, that we uh, see thanks to the platform economy. And, uh, and that is something that it has already provided and needs to continue to provide. And uh, let me therefore end by uh, telling you a, a story that I have from the debate uh, in Sweden when I criticized the proposal for a directive earlier this year. Some spokespersons uh, from uh, uh, from uh, several unions that replied uh, that the platform economy was nothing new, nothing inventive. The, um, there's the, the platform economy is just a way for companies to skip out on their responsibilities as employers. And I think this, this is a picture that we must really challenge and that the platform economy is something new, it is inventive, and it's about services being provided at prices and speed that we have uh, never seen before, uh, before the platform economy, and it's thanks to the flexibility of the contractors. And uh, it is a wide group of people finding uh, a work-life uh, balance that is right for them uh, in a different time in their lives, and I think in an ever faster changing world. And I think it's clear from the studies uh, where, uh, where the contractors themselves uh, and not so-called experts were interviewed that this is the case. And, uh, and, it, and it is by a growing extent about experts being able to spend more time of their work days on what they do best and less time on administration. And I think because of Sweden's well-functioning, uh, but to many people, peculiar labor market model, uh, I spend a lot of my time here in European Parliament explaining why EU-wide legislation on new aspects of employment is something really negative. And I therefore want to uh, end my intervention today by underlining how valuable I think uh, the growing platform economy is in general will be for Europeans, both uh, for the ind independent contractors and for uh, consumers. And I think uh, this uh, is also something that is great for uh, for European competitiveness. So uh, that's where I end my, uh, my introduction. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this was a very good introduction. It gave us a, a lot to, to reflect. And, and I think it's refreshing that in the political discussion, I often hear only the, the critical points of, of, of the future of work, insecurity, and so on. But it's yeah also freedom, like you say, and, and also free choice. Sometimes I would say you should discuss not the future of work, the future of entrepreneurship would be better. Because if you speak with many of, of, of the people who are working, at these platforms or in this in these frameworks, they they understand themselves as entrepreneurs. So I think I already the discussions from the beginning very one-sided frame. Glenn, you are one of, of the representatives of of of, of uh, uh, very various of companies who are working in this field. What is your impression now or your points in the, in the in this legislation now and in the discussion? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Horst, and thank you for the fantastic introduction uh, speech there from Sara. And I'll sort of try and build on, on that and speak a little bit about the roles and wishes of freelancers, given that, of course, I'm one myself, as well as representing uh, a number of actors within this sector. Um, and really look forward to the discussion as well with the distinguished members of this panel. And really, I think we've, we've touched upon this now, that digitalization is really changing the way we work as well as the way we buy, sell and share goods and services. And we uh, see from the European Commission figures about the, how the digital platform economy is growing quickly. 28 million people in the EU work through digital labour platforms today. And this is expected to be over 
43 million by 2025. And I think that's really COVID-19 has turbocharged this trend as well, uh, with work being decoupled from a physical place. And the commission also acknowledges that the vast majority of these people are genuinely self-employed um, and legitimate independent workers need to be able to be freelancers and not shoehorned into a kind of an old fashioned model, which does not suit them. And, and while this probably not completely replaced traditional employment, more employers are actually realizing already they need a freelancer strategy, hiring the right talent they need to carry out specific roles and jobs as and when required. And as Sara was saying, it's good for citizens too. It's important to be able to allow the benefits of digitalization and allow the development of the platform economy, both technologically and economically and most importantly, allow workers to be able to earn money in new and flexible ways outside the traditional nine to five. And I think we see these seismic shifts that are underway, um, this demand for flexibility, choice and freedom from an ever increasing uh, percentage of the EU population. Today, we have independent contractors in the technology and medical sectors, uh, architects, lawyers, models, musicians, and artists. These are people we resent, represent to have more freedom and are earning more money because of it as well. And you know, our role is to protect this freedom. And just to follow up on some of the, uh, um, the data that we've been uh, uh, in, involved in, we saw the Kantar Seafor study, which said that um, seven out of 10 workers across the Nordics were thinking about freelancing in the future, also coupled with figures that over 50% of people either dislike or even hate their current jobs. And I think it's also at the moment underlining the fact that sort of platform work, gig work uh, is still very much a sideline for many and complementary. 70% um, of the population was the figures that came out of the Copen Copenhagen economic study from last year. But the other message we get loud and clear is that freelancers value this flexibility in their working hours and the flexibility also to choose what they do. And this has also been borne out in the initial feedback we're getting from our um, Future of Work Study 2022, where we're looking again at the voice of uh, uh, freelancers. And the initial data is very interesting. 60% are actually over 35. Uh, majority are actually highly educated. Um, over 60% have a, at least a bachelor's degree. 40% have been doing it for more than five years. And the vast majority have over 5,000 uh, euros um, uh, a month they're earning from this work as well. And I think that this, this comes through very strongly as well as the anecdotal view that this is a lifestyle choice for many, uh, as well as an opportunity for people to make money from their passion. So when it comes to listening to the voice of, uh, uh, of freelancers, um, it's important to really understand how the world of work is changing. And, uh, you know, there are individuals who, who will say that it's just the same thing, but that's really sort of putting your head into the sand to realize, not realizing the changes that are underway. We're not in the 1950s anymore, and we really need to hold a, a mirror up to this uh, reality. But of course, uh, trade unions and traditional labor organizations often do not want to hear this since they quite rightly realize this is a threat to their status, it's a threat to their power, and also a threat to their relevance. And for some, it is really thanks to the platform economy, they're able to make money. We hear a lot of stories from, uh, from immigrants in particular who are finding it difficult to enter local labor markets, and the platform economy allows them the opportunity to work while the closed, unionized traditional economy shuts them out. Furthermore, digitalization is helping to make black jobs white. Those um, uh, uh, professions and uh, activities that have been part of the shadow economy, uh, meaning that workers do not have any social provisions, sick pay or pension cover, um, also means that, of course, the money is not going to enter state coffers to pay for schools and hospitals. And rather than being seen as perpetuating this reality, the platform economy is actually addressing these concerns. One of the issues we are hearing from a lot of platform workers, though, is this idea of uh, they feel marginalized. It's down to the banking sector, financial infrastructure, which is geared still towards strict traditional structures. Uh, bank customers are either private or corporate um, customers. And issuing loans to individuals is based on them having a fixed uh, term employment contract 
and a regular stable source of income. And this is something that many platform workers uh, do not have, can't point to. So securing a loan for a car or an apartment is extremely difficult. And this is something that uh, seeing people uh, marginalized um, and not being able to take up the sort of the full potential of the platform economy. And when it comes to the work, the, the platform workers' rights um, a directive itself, the ability to be a freelancer should be protected. Um, Article 4 and that presumption of employment also needs to be uh, amended as well. Far too prescriptive uh, at the moment, far too limiting. And as we've seen from the example of Spain, these kind of controls can actually have the, uh, the opposite effect in terms of creating jobs, growth and security for workers. And I think the big thing just to, to, to finish with is we've laid the groundwork and there's so much momentum that this movement is uh, taking us even further. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, despite being tragic, has opened a window of opportunity as, as well. People are more used to remote work, using technology more than ever before. So in essence, I think that what we really need to be able to do is, is change the game and help people. We need to be able to uh, open up the possibilities of technology to young people, old people, immigrants, people with disabilities, um, also working mo mothers and fathers who want to earn extra cash because these are sectors of the population who found it difficult to get into the traditional labour markets and thrive there. And I think we really need to get to develop this groundswell and this movement, ensuring that the legislative framework allows the future of work to flourish rather than be strangled by a set of outdated rules. Thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah, happy to answer questions after the presentations are finished. Thank you, Glenn. I think you raised a lot of points were very important. Also discrimination of safe employment in general in the financial sector to get the credit is much harder than if you're employed. So I think it's, it's something what we should really change. And also the rethinking of social protection and, 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 and also rethinking how we're working. It's not arrived in, in, in the societies, but it's, this makes this discussion so important. David, what is your, at the moment, feeling about what's going on in the parliament, about the regulation of the future of work? Is this going in the right direction or are you feeling that it's a little, this is really harming uh, the, the, the developments in this new branch? And this is new industry, please, plus you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the way you asked the question, I can do this very short by saying no, it's not going in the right direction. But if you want to, I can expand a little bit on that as well. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I, I, I work at Bolt, as you said. Uh, Bolt is a platform with both ride hailing and couriers and also other verticals. So we are very much uh, uh, at the core of the platform economy. Um, I would start by noting that the proposal we see from the commission is titled working conditions but if you look into the actual proposal it's really just about employment status uh, it's a bit unfortunate uh, the way we see it is that the, the the proposal needs a radical change from what the commission has proposed and also from what we see from the rapporteur because otherwise de facto the proposal will reclassify everybody working through our platforms and all of these will be um, employees against their will um, to expand a little bit on that, I'd like to make three observations. Uh, the first one, uh, and this is a question that really should have been asked quite a long time ago, and that is, who wants it? Because certainly not us platforms, and certainly not the workers working through it either. Um, we've done a number of surveys of well, primarily about the ride-hailing drivers, and they tell us very clearly that the things they value about most with working with us are the specifics of being self-employed. 84% of the drivers say that a flexible schedule and higher earnings are the most important things for them. And these are things that would run the risk of being lost if a mandatory employment were pushed upon them. 85% um, of the drivers prefer deciding for themselves which hours they would want to work rather than working on set shifts that also most likely would, become, would be the consequence of employment. And 70% of the drivers, they prefer switching between different platforms in order to earn more. Now, this would certainly not be an option available for drivers who are employed because non-compete clauses are standard practices and also a natural consequence of being employed. We've also done studies on couriers um, by Copenhagen Economics. And when we read that report, we see that only 20% of them, the couriers being asked, would continue in a traditional employment. 
uh, if a flexible engagement model no longer will be available to them. So the, the, the surveys and the studies we do are speaking with one voice, that the work, people working on the platforms, they do not want this. And going back to where I started, it's unfortunate because this is a question that should have been asked even before we embarked on this. Um, my second observation is that the proposal at its stance will lead to job losses. Um, we know that an employment model which with shift workers would not only make our services less consumer friendly as we would not be able to adjust supply to fit demand and demand on the platforms is very flexible. Um, it would also favor full-time work for platforms. Um, when we look at this uh, and the consequences of doing this, uh, Compax Lexicon has estimated that around 150,000 ride hailing drivers and around a quarter of a million delivery couriers would run the risk of losing their income if a mandatory employment were pushed upon them. And I think these are numbers that are so big that we, we cannot uh, not take them into account. Uh, the third one is going back a little bit to what Sara spoke about and also what, what Glenn touched upon. Um, this will lead to very strange outcomes. Uh, a good example, think of two ride hailing drivers, one working on the Bolt platform and another one working through a central dispatch center with maybe a two-way radio or communication. The first one, looking at the proposal at the stance right now, would be reclassified as an employee, despite this not might being their wish, wish, but they would be sort of labeled as a bogus self-employed. The second one, the guy working with a two-way radio, they would not be working through a platform and therefore they would not be reclassified. They would be subject to the same rules as everyone else when determining whether or not they're self-employed or not. And that means that the court would be using uh, the proposal when assessing the bolt driver, but they would go and use the yodel criteria when assessing whether or not the old style fashion taxi driver was a self-employed or not. Uh, and we, we know all, 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 all know the yodel criteria. Can they work for for, for competitors? Can they use subcontractors? Can they turn down tasks? And can they choose their own working hours? And these are the four criteria that really should be the standard that would should be applied across the board rather than inventing something new. Otherwise, we will de facto be incentivizing uh, the low tech model of radios and offices over 21st century uh, modern digital platforms. And this seems somewhat at odds with the EU's digital agenda. And just to come to conclusion, uh, we platforms do want to be judged on the same basis as everyone else. So if the presumption must apply, uh, then at least let it be based on the Yodel criteria. That was my very, very short note. Thank you very much for your brief uh, points. I think it's very clear structured and uh, I think it's important um, that, that we uh, see also that uh, this business and the criteria, you cannot, like you say, we cannot regulate it with, with the approach of the 20th century if, if we are now going up in the 21st century. And I think always the new ideas of regulation, the new thinking is missing. We try the old medicine for, for, for new, new um, uh, problems. And there are problems who are regulated but in the way they are approached now, I think it's, it's not the right way. Huh? The operation is successful, the patient is dead in the end. So uh, I think the best we have to find where we bring the, the, the uncertainty and, and also the opportunities together and make the best of it. Adam, um, ZPP is in the majority representing SMEs, but also large companies. What is your, your opinion about this? I think it's the Central Eastern Europe is anyway like Scandinavia, a little bit more open for, for these developments than, than uh, the South or the Central Europe. So what is your uh, position here? Uh, first of all, Horst, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to see that we can gather so many uh, stakeholders, policymakers to discuss this important um, topic. Uh, what has been already mentioned, this sector is um, creating jobs for millions of people. We have uh, over 500 platforms operating in, uh, in Europe. 
So that is why I'm truly concerned to hear uh, what David has said, actually, that uh, it, it might be a real threat. It's a very concrete thing. It might be a real threat to, to, to thousands, millions of people uh, who are having a job now. And I believe, and as a PP, we believe there's something that we should not pose a risk, uh, both for entrepreneurs and for the uh, platform workers. And from our side, uh, ZPP has commissioned a study in the beginning of the year among, uh, among contractors uh, working through, uh, through online platform works. And what very clearly came out from our study is that 95% uh, of, of platform workers are satisfied uh, with, their, with their occupation. And this is something very concrete. And this actually really doubts what is the motivation for such a harsh uh, regulation uh, regarding the platform works. Uh, what is more, 93% um, uh, of workers perceive their financial situation as good and satisfactory. So then uh, from this perspective, um, all the presumptions uh, being said about the gig work being perceived as the, as the non-satisfactory temporary job are not really accurate. They do not find any justification in our study. Um, on the other hand, 96% of workers uh, perceive, find the working conditions with platforms as uh, fair. Then again, what is the motivation to, um, to come in with such a, a burdening regulation uh, and, and have this uh, and interfere uh, the current working relations? Uh, to, to conclude uh, with our studies, I also wanted to say that over 80% of people plan to work, to continue their work with platforms in the long term. So, as I already said, this is not a solution that would only come as a temporary mean of work. That is why we need to make sure that the current working conditions are being made, uh, are um, as comfortable as, as satisfactory for, uh, for uh, platform workers as they have been before. And coming back to your question, Horst, um, ZPP is uh, standing uh, very strongly, we have a firm position on uh, protecting um, the access to services that are cheap, uh, broadly accessible, and on the other hand, to 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 provide entrepreneurs um, uh, to provide entrepreneurs the possibility to to contract the workers easily, and also for the platform workers to. Um, to earn and to perform the work in an easy manner and beneficial for them. Uh, that is why we perceive this uh, proposal as, um, as uh, simply uh, over-regulating for the condition of Polish market. And uh, additionally, I would like to say that um, it might target the least vulnerable uh, workers since um, the features, the characteristic of the platform work is that it's flexible and there's a low entry level to perform this work. And when we restrict uh, those conditions, those uh, entry levels, we risk that those who already struggle with performing the full-time job uh, might find it harder to, to find any other um, occupation, especially when you speak about people with the migrant background or those who simply cannot perform the full-time job. This is why we, we, we stand in the position to, to uh, simply ease the, the work perform uh, for, for, for those platform workers. Mm. 
Yes, I'm very open to, to, to hear what are also the perspectives from the other European uh, countries and markets. I'm very glad to hear the Swedish perspective. Um, and, and yes, I believe that uh, also not keeping, uh, not keeping the regulations um, on, the same, on the same level might lead to the data fragmentation, which in fact will also worsen the working conditions and the operation of the platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, you have two very important points mentioned. This was uh, this vulnerable uh, workers or imp uh, entrepreneurs. I have to say for many, like I heard from, from a study by Uber that in, in France, there are, it's really a chance for people who are very many years unemployed to, to, to enter the, this as the first stage again to come back to work. And I think this is, we have to see also, but is there, if, if platform workers are so happy, why we have now this discussion? I think sometimes it's also a conflict between the old business models and the new business models. It's not about the people who are working in these platform models, or I, I, I'm wrong. But Sarah, what is your reaction now to all the statements? Huh? Is this uh, underlining your position or what we would react on it? I believe that uh, I, I think uh, there seems to be different perspectives, but uh, providing the same uh, a fuller picture on, on the same uh, position that, that I think I uh, had in my introduction. And I really believe that uh, people working in the platform economy, but also uh, us seeing all the, the benefits of it really needs to, to do a better job, I guess. Uh, the, describing this and of course uh, when we see a, a changing uh, labor market uh, there this this causes of course disruptions also for the of the, the old system and uh, but but in the uh, the end we find that both for uh, I believe consumers but also for competitiveness as whole we are we're winners in in, in this system and I think uh, especially in the times uh, we have seen and in, in, uh, with uh, with COVID in in hindsight, uh, we see that many companies maybe wouldn't have been as, as successful without the platform economy uh, providing such good matching between uh, consumers and and uh, and businesses. So I really think uh, this this should have been more. Uh, this this probably is more more clear now, but uh, we we still have a lot of work to do uh, here in parliament with uh, with the con concrete proposal to see where it ends and and uh, i will of course uh, come back to uh, to you on on how these uh, this this work uh, evolves as well so thank you we have also a first question from the audience from you uh, steffi could you read the question Yes, <clears throat> you have pre previously said loud flex about flexibility and reported concerns regarding to self-employment that the contractors self-employed may be misleadingly considered as employers. Regarding some of the platforms, especially in Poland where I live, there were issues regarding contracts made between platform companies and their contractors. Notable example was an employment under the cover of bicycle leading contract. Are there any minimal requirements from your point of view that will be uh, that will erase aberrations like above and would not force people working to platforms to b2b contracts when they require or desire a more stable form of employment or simply do not want to establish a company is this more a question perhaps for adam or sarah you want to answer this or adam perhaps <laughs> you start for first because you are the expert for poland yes well um let me start with the um, with the thing that the form, the the type of contract that is being chosen by by majority um, of the um, of the platform workers, is actually their independent choice. And what comes clearly from our study, uh, most of those workers are satisfied with the legal form of employment. It also comes with um, other uh, benefits. I mean, the Polish um, employment market is um, quite open and flexible to matter. 
and simply B2P contracts are more beneficial uh, to workers than the employment contracts are. So in this way, um, obviously, I wouldn't agree that workers are forced uh, to perform through the P2P contracts, they might, uh, they might find the opportunity to contract through the uh, other means. I mean, the, the market is competitive. There are different platforms. So also with that, uh, there comes different possibilities for them to perform the work. Mm. And I, uh, in, in, yes, sorry. No, please finish. <laughs> Yes, yes, and uh, and I I would just only maybe make it somehow uh, clear and and um, draw the attention to the fact that if we want to regulate um, the type of contract that would bind that would cover platform workers, we need to be very aware to adjust the the directive. Uh, to the state of play in different uh, national labor markets. Because for Poland and CE, uh, as I can see also from our discussion, it is much different than it might be in the in the Western Europe. First, uh, I believe we need some um, adaptation to make it more flexible uh, in Polish market. Also, also, because it comes with many other consequences, such as taxation. And uh, yes, it's not simply just uh, introducing a, a directive, but it comes with many legal consequences in other spheres. So we need to keep that in mind. So this is, a, this is already what Sarah means, that, that we have many different situations in Europe. So you want, would like to add something or it's for you, I think this question is answered, but Sarah, if you would like. Yeah, just briefly before I, uh, I leave, I'm mm -hmm. of course not fully aware uh, of, of the details on, on the, the Polish market. And I think that's really one of the, my main arguments is that the labor markets in the different member states are so vastly different from one another. So that, that's one of the reasons why a directive cannot target specific issues that we see. Of course, there are issues that probably needs to be uh, regulated by, uh, by some kind of legislation i'm not saying that i know it's what should be the, the the solution for this specific case but of course uh as with with most labor market there, there needs to be some some control but to have a european wide directive that 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 tries to fix every issue that is so vastly different between the member states with a directive uh it's it's really going to damage competitiveness and maybe not even solve the specific problems that we see and and in some uh, some of the member states so i think this is really one of the uh, main problems and also as a eu pol a policy maker that uh, it is very hard to find uh find uh, a solution for for all the way through once but uh i've come you. to to the end of my yes uh, well, only one here, last so. last thing only one last last short question what we can do to to yes now as as business sector to support uh, to to be, become better part of the discussion from your point of view should we deliver more data should we be more active what we could could do to support your work in the parliament i think uh, really uh, get in touch with uh, with uh, members in 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 the committees uh, providing these studies are really helpful but also uh, the people that are, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very safe uh, vote <laughs> mm -hmm. for competitiveness, but the ones that are uh, in the middle, constructive people in, in, in the Renew group, for instance, and maybe also some, uh, some S and D could be, uh, could be good to really reach out to, uh, to the, the swing voters in, in, in our uh, parliament. So. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, I wish you. you good luck with your work and a wonderful week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you again. Oh, Horst, could I could I add something? Yes, of course. We are here to, still yeah. to no, discuss. The, 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 we 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 cannot forget a very important thing, and that is mm -hmm. that the platform economy is a rather new feature. It's mm -hmm. a couple of years old, and if you look at the innovative pace that we see both in the way that consumer demand is adapting to the possibility, but also the way that technical platforms are developing, we're just in the beginning. And to strike such a sector with heavy regulation, which is happening now, 
if ever there was a risk of premature regulation, I would argue this is now. Now, please don't misunderstand me because I think we are all in agreement that we need to develop the working conditions for platform workers. So none of us are opposing it. It's just that the proposed directive is just the entirely wrong answer to the right question. And if you look then and what we need to do in order to improve the working conditions for those working on the platforms, then that is not a, an easy fix. And as, as we just discussed, it, it differs among all the member states, but we have just a simple thing to create a working interface between platform workers and the uh, public security and the social security systems. That does not work in all countries. Most couriers pay taxes, but they don't get access to the social welfare system. And in that lies a lot of the insurances that will be required in order for wealth platform works to be safe. And I think we've just started on this on the wrong end. And, and that is where I would so appreciate to see a more emphasis. Okay, how, how, do, how do we deploy interfaces between us as platforms, between, in the case of couriers, restaurants, couriers, consumers, uh, authorities and, and the, the social system, that's where we need to do the big development because that is only there that we can actually can improve the working conditions for, for the platform workers. Uh, it, it needs to be said, and again, it's if ever, this must surely qualify as premature regulation. Yes, I, I think you're totally right. We have also to see that we have, uh, we had also a reality before the platform work, 99% of SMEs are uh, uh, companies are SMEs, but 60% of these SMEs one, are one-person companies. Yeah. So the majority of SMEs are one-person companies. And I have to say, if you see what's going on with social security, with if they have a, a blow, they're going bankrupt, how they get the credit the second time, nearly impossible, yes. because they, 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 are, they are burned. So there was not only happiness before, there was huge problems who are still there. And, how many uh, family members work in a, in a small company with black with, because it's necessary, not paying taxation, no social security? Also, this is not solved. So uh, I, I think sometimes the, the discussion is really not a little bit focused of all these problems on, on the platform economy, no. and you don't see the, the opportunities. No, and, and part of the reason for that is that while I think most of them on, on, on this call feel that uh, the platform directive is, is the biggest thing since sliced bread was invented. If you go to the capitals, not everyone is aware that this even is a discussion. So I think there's a big discrepancy between Brussels and the capitals on this one, because we really need to get the local politicians and national politicians uh, not only involved, but also interested in finding how do we create that balance, which gives us a possibility to build an ecosystem around platforms that sort of mirrors European social values in the right way. Um, but there's a lot of interesting work ahead for us all, I think. Yeah, Adam, perhaps you say also something. You're presenting all kind of business. How is the discussion in the business sector? Because there's also competition between the business models. Huh? Some, I think, uh, arrived established businesses, uh, seeing that platform economy takes shares from them. How open is the discussion? Uh, do you see a development for all of them? Or is this more like to say there's a winner and a loser? and how to moderate this, Adam? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe first coming back to what David has said. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I agree that is not the, that is not the right, um, not the right angle to begin the work to regulate mm -hmm. um, the, the platform work. Um, somehow I, I have a thing that we should rather start a broader reflection over the labor law and how it is, um, how we can adapt to the modern means of, of, of work. Because somehow, maybe it's not actual anymore. Why do we want to regulate so harshly uh, platform work, which seems to be efficient and satisfactory for both parts, uh, instead of reflecting over the labor law regulations that seem to rather have a negative impact on the development and growth of uh, the work platforms. So this is something that um, that somehow uh, comes from our expertise as CTPP to, to, to see that to see that issue in the bigger perspective, not just to focus how to push the 
platforms now to uh, to to diminish the, the position. Um, and it comes to SMEs, um, especially saying it's from the Polish perspective. Uh, we perceive the platforms um, as an intermediary that provides uh, many entrepreneurs the chance to sell their products, to provide the services, because it connects very efficiently um, customers with, uh, with those who can provide the service of the product. So especially during the pandemic, we could, we, we could solve how, um, how uh, efficiently uh, certain um, branches of economy could continue to, um, to work. Uh, to sell the products, uh, which on the other hand wouldn't be possible with the intermediary of the platforms. So for us, we perceive this as a very big technological achievement. Uh, we need to use it um, fully to embrace its uh, potential. Uh, and yet, as I said, uh, when we speak about working conditions, uh, we should focus how to improve them by regulating, by changing, adapting the labor law in it. Glenn, uh, now you're coming nearly to a conclusion and closing. Yeah. What do you take out of the discussion? What is your plans now? What do you want to promote to do to platform work and, and the future of work? What are your, what are your uh, lessons now and, and, and activities? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, two, there's three levels to this. One is, is is continue with collecting data and actually sort of the new Unveil app that we've got, which actually pulls out the data on hours worked and actually uh, the amounts earned as well, which I think is exciting and a bit of a first. Secondly, is actually continue the education of this sector, what it really means. It's very new. It's evolving all the time, but there's a lot of misinformation and also misunderstanding about what's actually going on at the moment. So that's going to be a crucial part of what we're doing. And in the, 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 the short term, really look to the swathe of, uh, uh, of legislation, particularly the platform worker rights, get that as, as right as is possible in terms of the uh, amendments. Uh, and get it on a better track, certainly away from where it is at the moment. And also the kind of shoulder content, as I would call it, so DMA, DSA, uh, EU Data Act, there's all, all uh, elements which, which feed into kind of the digitalization of society and the, uh, the labor market. We need to get all these things right and make sure that they're all properly connected too, so that we don't miss out on opportunities for growth, jobs, and entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. I think we are now in the end of, of the discussion. And I have to say, I, I think we are not in the end. We are at the beginning. Like David says, this is a very new, uh, new uh, uh, development. And like I told in the beginning, 80% of the jobs are still not existing who are created until 2030. Um, I think sometimes if I'm reading the commission's uh, proposals, it starts always protection, protection, protection then create jobs and, and grow. I think this is perhaps uh, the wrong approach. We should start with the chances and then to protect. It is uh, not excluding one side, but uh, I think if you want to be on the top with, with Asia, with, with United States, and we want to have also unicorns and, and, and I think the last very big company or from the digital area, is SAP from 1972. I think it's uh, 50 years ago since we had now a, a global pay, player in the sector. And if you're starting only to regulate, we will have really, uh, I think, huge problems to be part of the future, to, to really also not only consuming, also creating. David, I give you the last chance because, please. Uh, I, I might have missed something, but surely you did not mean that SAP was the last big European digital company, because if I may, I represent one. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, it's about the uh, turnover. Huh? I think SAP is still, because it was two companies, in fact, but the last, I think, 1972 SAP from the turnover, it was about the discussion in the context of 
DMA, huh? Or DSA, yeah. <laughs> but, but Honestly, that's a very interesting discussion. And I think you have the Spotify, you have TransferWise, you have a number mm -hmm. of big digital companies that have grown in Europe now. But I think the, the interesting part with the platform economy is that here you have an interface between digitization and, and uh, social values, which are entirely new. And that is the sort of borderland where we are working. And I do think that we European companies are equipped in a different way than the American companies to find the proper balance here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would hope, I was hoping that, or I am hoping that the commission will see this and also help us fix this. I, I think in the end, it will be also a competition of the best entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and partners from the platforms. Yes. Because in the end, there are only a, a certain amount of drivers and, and, and so on. Huh? So you will fight about the best conditions. And this is market and, ma and functional market is a social market in the end. It must be functional. And this, I think it's the important thing the European Union has to create a functional environment. And this means business can survive and grow. And at the same time, there are no monopoles and there is, is, is parts of benefits for SMEs, for the consumers. And it means there must be fair competition. And if you can create this, I think we are in a good way, but not then we have an unfunctional market, a debt market, and uh, shrinking companies or no companies anymore. But I think the discussion is important because it's a discussion who is really touched by everybody. It's, it's a fundamental discussion, how we see the future and how we see uh, our social protection. I think it's a value social protection. We should not say it is really worth to discuss it and we should transform so much as possible, but not overdoing it. That it's so that we can say, it must in the right balance, like in the past, also for the new economy. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and see you next time. Bye.